Hi, my name is Riddhi. I'm a research director at the University of Washington Harry Bridges Labor Center. We welcome you to the Power and a Pension Forum. Although we gather virtually to the, today, we at the Bridges Center here in Seattle acknowledge that our lives and our institutions occupy the unceded ancestral homelands of the Duwamish, Suquamish, Snoqualmie, and Puyallup peoples, past and present, as well as the tribes of the Muckleshoot, Tulalip, other Coast Salish peoples, and their descendants. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the native and indigenous peoples who have stewarded it through the generations and continue to honor and bring to light their ancient heritage. This land acknowledgement is one small act in the ongoing process toward true allyship, and we commit to uplifting the voices, experiences, and histories of the indigenous people of this land and beyond. This is the first time the Bridges Center has hosted a forum discussing issues at the intersection of pension funds, private equity, and climate justice. And we are so pleased that there is such incredible interest in the topic. We have over 200 people registered, including indigenous rights, environmental and labor activists, students, university faculty and staff across North America, policymakers, reporters and representatives from pension fund and asset managers representing over $13.8 trillion in assets under management. Thank you all for joining us. We're very fortunate to have our esteemed guests with us today. Let me start by introducing our moderator, Michael McCann. Michael is the Gordon Hirabayashi Professor for the Advancement of citizenship at the University of Washington. Michael has previously served as chair of the political science department and the director of the uh, Bridges Labor Center. Michael's research focuses on the politics of rights-based struggles for social justice with an emphasis on challenges to race, gender, and class hierarchies. His early research publications addressed environmental advocacy and struggles for shareholder democracy. Michael is author of over 60 article length publications and of numerous books, including his most recent book with George Lovell, titled Union by Law, Filipino American Labor Activists, Rights Radicalism, and Racial Capitalist Empire. And with that, I'll pass it over to Michael. Thank you, Ridby. Thanks for inviting me and thank you so much for your vision, your commitment, your diligence, and your superb organizing efforts to make this event happen. This wouldn't be happening without you. You would dispute that climate change is here and is causing a wide range of impacts on everyone, particularly those who are most marginalized in our societies. The latest addition to the mountain of evidence for this came from a long report and call for action just a few days ago from the International Energy Agency. Climate change is a result of a legacy of extraction for capital accumulation. According to the co-chair of the Climate Justice Alliance, Elizabeth Yampierre, a lot of times when people talk about environmental justice, they go back to the 1970s or 60s. But it's important, you said, to think about the slave quarters, to think about people who got the worst food, the worst health care, the worst treatment, and then were freed, were given lands, were eventually surrounded by things like petrochemical industries. The idea of killing Black people or Indigenous peoples, all of that has a long, long history that is centered on capitalism and the extraction of land and labor in our country. The University of Washington's Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies has a long history of studying the intersections of race and labor. As such, I'm very proud to be part of this esteemed panel to continue the discussion and interrogate how the labor movement's retirement capital, or rather public pension fund capital, is tied to advancing climate change, particularly through private equity. Private equity firms like Blackstone, Apollo, uh, Kane and Anderson are very different from public equity, such as Black, BlackRock, Fidelity, or Shell, in a number of ways. First, private equity firms are subject to far less scrutiny from regulatory agencies like the Securities and Exchange Commission. Unlike public equity, private equity firms are not legally obligated to public disclosure. Private equity Investments also are more illiquid. So divesting from private equity is not as feasible as selling shares on a stock exchange. And private equity firms promise much higher returns compared to the stock market, but they also charge much higher fees. Although private equity firms have invested billions in fossil fuels using public pension fund capital over recent decades, environmental and labor activists have not interrogated the climate impacts of private equity firms in the same way as they have investigated, interrogated public companies such as Exxon, Shell, and 
uh, and its financial backers, such as Wel Wells Fargo, BlackRock, or Fidelity. Today's conversation will provide us all an opportunity to learn from some of the successes pension fund trustees and environmental activists have had in public markets. And we will also learn about the role private equity plays in the ener energy industry. Together, I hope that we will learn what we learn will fuel further discussions and new ideas for helping us realize a clean energy future. To help us do that, we're fortunate to have a panel of environmental and indigenous rights leaders and activists, labor affiliated trustees from Canada and the United States, and a private equity expert. Together, they will shed light on the impact of private equity's fossil fuel investments on marginalized communities, the environment, and investors. And they will also highlight some successful strategies that enable environmental activists and pension fund trustees to advocate for clean energy investments while upholding the fund's fiduciary duty to its beneficiaries. My role as moderator is first to introduce each of our five invited speakers who will talk from five to 10 minutes. When they're done, I will pose several questions to them that they have, pre that have been previously distributed for responses and discussion. Along the way, I invite everyone in the audience to submit questions at any time during the event using the Zoom chat function or the, the Q&A function. Chats will be read only by our panelists and staff, but we will um, select some and, and make sure that we get some full answers. Okay, so let's get going. We begin, our first speaker is Alyssa Chikino. Alyssa is the Climate Director at the Private Equity Stakeholder Project, a nonprofit working to engage investors and communities around the impacts of private equity investments. She has experience as an advocate and researcher in climate policy, worker justice, and capital stewardship. She has previously worked for the United Auto Workers, Unite Here, and Service Employees International Union. Welcome, Alyssa. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really honored to share this virtual stage with these remarkable panelists, and thanks to the University of Washington Labor Center for hosting this important conversation. Uh, globally, private equity firms manage $7.5 trillion, which is expected to grow substantially in the next few years. Private equity firms have invested billions across the fossil fuel industry, including pipelines, LNG export terminals, coal plants, fracking, and drilling. Due to the private equity industry's lack of regulatory oversight and general opacity, the climate impacts of these substantial fossil fuel holdings haven't been subjected to adequate scrutiny. We are facing a growing climate crisis where our actions today will determine our fate. To quote Ugandan climate activist Vanessa Nakate, there is no future in the fossil fuel industry and we cannot drink oil. Meaningful reductions in carbon are vital for each and every year of the next decade to carve a 1.5 degree pathway, as science and the IPCC have confirmed. And of course, communities of color and the global poor are already shouldering the burden of our past inaction. This is a moment of urgent opportunity. The US has rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement, affirmed a goal of cutting emissions in half by 2030. We need continued political will to strengthen environmental regulations and push for scrutiny and accountability for fossil fuel companies across the entire value chain. There is tremendous work on companies operating in the public markets by activists and shareholders to mitigate climate in impacts. But there is a universe of economic actors outside of the public markets like private equity that are finding buying opportunities in assets shed by publicly traded companies. Politico recently wrote that utilities, oil producers and others in their bid to meet investor and societal demands are simply shifting plants, pipelines and other polluting assets to private firms that are less accountable. For example, Private equity firms have scooped up coal plants, prolonging their usage, even as utilities have shed them to meet demands from shareholders. Fossil fuel investments have performed poorly for private equities investors for a long time, long before the COVID pandemic's impacts on oil pricing and market demand. The majority of energy funds have lost money over the last decade. With the disruption of oil markets from the pandemic, many of the investments that private equity firms made in fossil fuel exploration, production, or infrastructure will end up being money losers. At the same time, the heavy debt load resulted in private equity-backed oil and gas companies dominating the unusually high number of bankruptcies in the sector in 2020. Yet, despite the writing on the wall, private equity firms are still investing in fossil fuels across the spectrum, 
Absent pressure and real accountability, private funds managers will continue to invest institutional investors' capital in oil and gas despite the risks. The private equity industry is quite adept at marketing for ESG, environmental, social, and governance issues, but there is a chasm between rhetoric and reality. A recent survey of private equity managers by PwC found that although firms increasingly claim to incorporate ESG into their strategic thinking, 47% have not taken any work in understanding the climate risk exposure of their portfolios. There are many examples of major recent private equity deals buying fossil fuel assets, and very noticeably, investing to expand and operate pipelines. EIG's $12 billion deal to buy Saudi Arabia's pipelines, Blackstone's $6.3 billion acquisition of Tallgrass Energy, Warburg Pincus buying Delta Main, Mid, Midstream, Carlisle buying gas-fired power plants, refineries, and oil exploration companies. Let's talk about KKR as one example. One of the largest private equity firms with $250 billion in assets under management. We are privileged to have Slado in the conversation today who will help us understand the impacts of KKR's problematic investment in the Coastal GasLink pipeline. Coastal GasLink is one of dozens of fossil fuel investments in KKR's extensive energy portfolio. Just last month, KKR had entered a $3.4 billion deal to buy Sempra Energy infrastructure. It entered a $4 billion deal with the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company's pipelines in 2019. KKR also owns fossil fuel companies in South Texas and New Mexico, where the majority Latino communities are exposed to polluted air and water. KKR's energy and natural resources funds have suffered significant negative returns. KKR's 2010 Natural Resources Fund reported a net IRR of negative 28%, and its 2013 Energy and Income Growth Fund won posted a negative 5% as of the end of last year. At least three of KKR's fossil fuel investments have gone bankrupt, including the Longview Coal Power Coal Plant that filed for bankruptcy in April of 2020. You'll hear more from Molly in a few minutes. KKR's portfolio gives compelling examples of why private equity firms need to be accountable and transparent about their holdings and climate impacts. In order to hold firms across the private equity industry accountable, investors like public pension funds need to demand more now. Just yesterday, uh, the International Energy Agency released the world's first comprehensive study of how to transition to net zero energy system by 2050 and presented a narrow but still achievable pathway to get us all to that goal. They recommend that from today, there should be no investment in new fossil fuel supply projects, including both oil and gas. Um, and no further investment in unabated coal plants. At the Private Equity Stakeholder Project, we have been demanding that private equity managers publicly disclose the direct and indirect environmental impacts of their current holdings. The public needs this information to hold them accountable for their impacts on the environment and on marginalized communities. They should commit to transition their portfolios away from fossil fuels no later than 2030, not 2040, not 2050, 2030, that transition should be just and equitable for the workforces and communities impacted by their investments. And they should align all political spending, including by executives and portfolio companies, with a 1.5 degree scenario. Investors and stakeholders have a critical role to play in calling on private equity managers to take responsibility for their contributions to climate change and moving on to a sustainable path. Regulators also have a role. The SEC is inviting public input on how to mandate climate disclosures. It's important that private equity firms, which are very lightly regulated by the SEC, be held to the same standards as publicly traded companies. From our work, we know that asset managers by themselves won't do the right thing. We as stakeholders know that there is no short-term or long-term future in fossil fuels. It's time for private equity asset managers and their investors to recognize the writing on the wall, take advantage of the opportunities to transition to a clean energy future now. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Next, we have Molly Wickham, better known as Slato. Slato is the spokesperson for the Gidenden Checkpoint on Wet'suwet'en Territory. She has been living on and occupying the territory since 2014 with her husband and children. You know, the checkpoint was an, in, has been an indigenous reoccupation site since 2018 and has been raided twice by the militarized Royal Canadian Mounted Police as a result of grassroots resistance to the private equity owned coastal gasoline pipeline project, which would transport frack gas 
from Northeastern British Columbia to the coast. Molly has a master's degree in indigenous governance from the University of Victoria and is heavily involved in the Wet'suwet'en clan governance system. Welcome, Slato. Hadi, Sai Slato, Sydney, Gidim Den Hesley, Wet'suwet'en is Den. Thank you so much for having me on the panel. Uh, my name I hold in Grizzly House of the Wet'suwet'en, uh, Slato. I'm one of the supporting chiefs within our clan governance system. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Coastal Gas Link project today. Um, it's a 670 kilometer frack gas pipeline planning to feed LNG Canada's liquefaction and export facility on the coast. Um, it's dependent on power from the Site C dam, as well as burning their own fracked gas at the LNG terminal, which is a huge carbon emitter. Um, Coastal Gas Link Project is estimated to release up to three and a half megatons of CO2 per year, approximately 5.5% of BC's and 0.5% of Canada's total emissions. Um, the owners and investors of this project, uh, like previously talked about, are KK and AIMCO, which share 65% of the shares of this company. TC Energy, formerly TransCanada, owns 35%, and they're funded by major Canadian banks, such as RBC, Bank of Montreal, CIBC, Scotiabank, and TD, as well as U.S. banks, um, such as J.P. Morgan Chase, and international banks in Australia, China, and Japan. So Coastal Gas Link has failed to, can, to gain free prior and informed consent from the proper title holders of this territory. Under Wet'suwet'en law, um, we govern ourselves through our clan system and our hereditary chiefs have full jurisdiction over 22,000 square kilometers of territory, which Coastal Gas Link plans to run their pipeline through the heart of our territory. They have not gained consent. Our chiefs have withheld consent for any projects or industry on our territories. Um, such as this. The Supreme Court of Canada ruled in 1997 that the Wet'suwet'en and Gixan had never extinguished title to our territories. Therefore, we can and will continue to govern our territories according to our law. This project has failed to establish any sort of meaningful policy to deal with Indigenous consent and has worked with the province and Canada to undermine our hereditary chief system, our governance system, by making deals with government-imposed elected band council systems along the pipeline route. These systems the band council systems were put in place to eliminate true Wet'suwet'en governance systems, which control Wet'suwet'en land. This was very purposeful, and it continues on today with the provincial and the federal governments um, in hand in hand with industries like fossil fuel pipelines. As a result of not gaining consent um, and not having proper policies to deal with Indigenous consent, uh, we have seen unprecedented resistance within our territories. We are upholding our Wet'suwet'en law by any means necessary. In 2010, the Unistoten, one of the five clans of the Wet'suwet'en, began occupying their territory and have since blocked pipelines and other industries out of their territories and have built a multi-million dollar healing center on their territory. In 2018, Gidim Den clan established a checkpoint to control access to pipeline workers, which resulted in two militarized raids on our territories and our people in 2019 and 2020. Another clan of the Wet'suwet'en, the Laksamasu, have also reoccupied their territories along the pipeline route. All of these occupations still exist, and despite a Supreme Court injunction, the Wet'suwet'en um, continue to follow our laws and resist this pipeline, both in the courts and on the ground through direct action. We are forcing change through direct action and grassroots resistance. In the winter and spring of 2020, supporters and allies shut down major Canadian infrastructure during what was dubbed as Shutdown Canada. Um, this movement crippled the Canadian economy for months. We've also received in 
international support. The Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination sent letters to Canada in both 2019 and 2020, condemning the work of Coastal Gas Link, the Site C Dam Project, and the Trans Mountain Pipeline Project because of the impacts that it has on Indigenous communities and because the Indigenous communities have denied consent for these projects. This creates huge instability and risk to investors. We know that the Coastal Gas Link project has been um, delayed for at least one year and many seasons um, due to direct action and the requirement of added infrastructure um, through the pipeline route. In 2018 and 2019, Wet'suwet'en resistance cost Coastal Gas Link 22 days of lost work, wages, and infrastructure. In 2020, it cost them 28 days of losses and other grassroots direction or direct action has cost them several seasons of delays that were argued in court by CGL themselves in order to get a permanent injunction against the Wet'suwet'en. For example, CGL's 2019-2020 construction schedule indicated that they would have completed directional drilling under our most sacred headwaters, Witsinkwa, in the last quarter of 2020. Environmental drilling under our sacred headwaters, or sorry, directional um, environmental restrictions now dictate that this work cannot be done until the last quarter of 2021. There have been additional COVID related delays. Um, there were two months of shutdown of Coastal Gas Link project because of COVID outbreaks within the man camps along within Wet'suwet'en territory and along the territory route. So we all know that time is money. And so this has caused the Coastal Gas Link project to, um, to go over budget and to not be able to meet their deadlines. Coastal Gas Link detailed all the delays and costs of delays in their 2019 affidavits during the injunction case. Um, the project manager for CGL on May 10th, 2019 in his affidavit said, Given the complexity of the project, it is not possible to properly quantify the increased cost to the project as a result of the delay described above, the resistance on the ground. But it is on the order of tens of millions of dollars. This was tens of millions of dollars prior to 2019. We are now into two more years of on the ground resistance from the Wet'suwet'en to this pipeline project. Further, the CEO of LNG Canada has expressed concerns over delays and extra costs in a 2021 interview with the Financial Post, saying that LNG Canada would not accept higher tolls from Coastal Gas Link because of delays in finishing over budget. The article says higher pipeline tolls would affect economics of shipping gas from Canada to Asia and would likely be resisted by LNG Canada's joint venture partners. In addition to this, the legal stability within so-called Canada is very, very unstable. Um, the United Nations Declaration of uh, Rights of Indigenous People has been legislated into law within the province of British Columbia and within Canada and affirms free prior informed consent of Indigenous communities, as well as our ability to self-determine our governance system and structures, which includes utilizing our traditional decision-making processes. The Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs have, through our traditional decision-making processes, denied consent for this pipeline project or any other pipeline project through our territories. As a result of the blockades in 2019 and 2020, the province and the Canadian government came to the table with the Wet'suwet'en and signed a memorandum of understanding to implement Wet'suwet'en title on 22,000 square kilometers of our territory. The province and the federal government have publicly affirmed the power and title of the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs. So regardless of whatever comes out of the discussion, this gives more strength and authority to the Wet'suwet'en under Western law and under Wet'suwet'en law. Further, and one of the most problematic things that's happening with this with this project is that Coastal Gas Link plans to run through Wet'suwet'en and other really unstable terrain. 
Wudzinkwa is our headwaters to our most important watershed and is home to the Pacific Coho spawning ground along with all the other species of salmon that we rely on as a people. This is integral to who we are, to our identity as Wet'suwet'en people. Both the Unistoten Healing Center and the Gidim Den Checkpoint rely on Wudzinkwa for our clean well, drinking water. And if this pipeline goes through, it will destroy our ability to drink the water from our river forever. It will disrupt our salmon populations, which are already under threat because of climate change. Just from the sediment alone, we will never ever be able to feed our children with Zinqua. We will never be able to drink that water again. Our children and our grandchildren might never ever be able to taste the salmon that is integral to who we are as a nation. This pipeline also plans to cross untouched terrain covered in glaciers and glacier fed lakes and wetlands. Um, within the last two years, there were four senior uh, engineers that resigned from Coastal Gas Link because the territories that they plan to go through are so unstable and they don't have a, a good plan in order to be able to successfully do this. These areas are home to grizzly bears, moose, caribou, and a huge population of other animals that have never been exposed to human contact. We know this will have devastating effects on our ability to feed ourselves into the future. Even now, with all the extra traffic in our area, the bears are no longer afraid of humans. Within the last several weeks, we've been approached by numerous bears that appear disoriented, confused and very aggressive, which has never before been an issue in our territory. This project threatens our water, our livelihoods as Wet'suwet'en people and the future for our Wet'suwet'en children. We will never stand down and will continue to res resist this project and others like it that do not gain consent from our people. It is a bad investment that will never see the returns that pensioners deserve. Aotsa, Masai. Thank you, Slato. Um, next, we have Eileen Bran. Eileen is a longtime activist in the retiree chapter in the Environmental Justice Working Group of the Professional Staff Congress, a union that represents 30,000 faculty and staff at the City University of New York, which is an affiliate of the American Federation of Teachers. Eileen has worked on PSC campaigns to press its affiliates in New York State, United Teachers, and AFT to support divesting teachers pensions from fossil fuels and urged New York State Comptroller DiNapoli to divest the state's large common retirement system from fossil fuels. Before retiring, Eileen was a research associate at Queens College's Michael Harrington Center and taught in Queens College's sociology department. Welcome, Eileen. Thank you. Um, like others, I appreciate very much being here today, not only to share what my experience or our experiences are trying to divest in New York State, but also to learn from the rest of you um, what the additional challenges will be going forward. So thanks. Um, the size of pension investments gives them power, but it's not an easy power to exercise. Today, close to three quarters of New York State's $450 billion public pension funds have agreed to divest from fossil fuels in a manner that meets their fiduciary responsibility. That will mean an additional three to four years of to complete the process at the very least. The comptrollers of the state and the city directly manage a large portion of the pension funds and also sit on the pension boards made up of employers and labor representatives. For example, Comptroller DiNapoli has re responsibility for the state's common retirement fund with $12 billion of its $210 billion fund still in fossil fuels. Initially, both controllers thought using their leverage as shareholders could influence the fossil fuel industry in spite of the industry's recalcitrance. Obviously, public pressure can and does influence elected officials, but it takes time. It took over eight years and a very broad coalition of environmental activists from 350.org, Food and Water Watch, People's Climate Movement, community and faith groups, um, indigenous groups, and a small number of unions, uh, AFSCME, communication workers, nurses, DC 37 city employees and PSC inside NYSET. It also took a wide array of tactics, 
That included demonstrations, picketing, lobbying, letters, letters to the editors, emails, and calls, including a power analysis that successfully targeted controller Scott Stringer first. Since September 2014, the huge demonstration at the onset of the UN meetings that led to the Paris Accords in December of 2014, um, that broad coalition that was brought together fortunately persisted. And I think our success is dependent on the fact that that network of unions, community groups, environmental groups hung together over the long haul to keep going on their, um, on their progressive climate environmental justice agenda. In 2018, Comptroller Stringer finally surrendered. Mayor de Blasio and Governor Cuomo all announced their commitment to divest from public uh, pension, to divest their public pensions. The actions by the governor and the mayor are largely symbolic, using their office as a pulpit. Nevertheless, it's significant because it gets media coverage. Um, New York State Comptroller DiNapoli, who oversees the Common Retirement Fund, continued to resist those calls for divestment until now. His change of heart now is because the state legislature is poised to pass a mandate that will require public pensions to divest that the governor will sign, thus bypassing the controller's authority over the pension fund, obligating him to implement it. Pension boards and controllers do not relish losing their authority of, or control over the pension funds. Ironically, TRS, the Teachers Retirement Fund, is the outlier, not yet committed to divest its pension funds, its $120 billion pension fund. It also, it, but it also recognizes the legislative threat that that, um, that that law, if passed and then signed by the governor, would have for them. Um, the pensions are incredible. The, the, the boards of pensions are incredibly conservative. They, they resist uh, outside influence. I think the members, even the labor representatives, tend to um, defer to what, who, who they consider the financial experts on their boards are. And they, um, they thereby, in a sense, are very resistant. And I think our experience with NYSIT the PSC and other locals um, developed resolutions to move the union as, as a way of moving the boards of directors. And there's also a group of, um, a, a divestment group that is just targeting both the union as well as targeting those boards. The fiduciary responsibility of the boards means that they're focused on protecting the fund, maximizing returns and minimizing risks. Also, what's a special situation in New York is that the leadership of the New York State United Teachers was also very, very close to Comptroller DiNapoli. So as long as he was resisting um, uh, divesting, they, in a sense, fell uh, along with that. So that initially the resolutions that PSC and other locals brought that emphasized the fiscal risks um, that staying in fossil fuels held were ignored because the response of the TRS board members who would be present at those NYSET meetings was to say that they could not take moral or political um, factors into, into consideration. So that in a sense gave them uh, a way to just dismiss any claims from members that it was time to get out of fossil fuels. And this is in spite of the fact that, again, New York State had experienced devastating floods in 2011 and 2012, as well as we're all witnessing and searing every day new reports of new institutions leaving fossil fuel investments. Nevertheless, it's very slow to change union leaderships and, on these factors, and it's very slow to change the board of directors. Finally, I think what's happening now is that they are committed to make those changes, even TRS, because I think they are so afraid that the legislation will pass and then they will lose control of their pension funds or lose an aspect of control of their pension funds. Right now, the TRS that is the holdout has $120 billion in pension funds. Um, 
and, uh, and it has not yet officially committed to invest. Um, the, the resolutions that union members like mine, you know, like my union and others locals brought were initially defeated. We started in 2015. They were only passed probably on AFT level on a, by a, the American Federation FT, AFT in 2018 and by us, by NICET in 2020. So I think that going forward will um, force the, the labor members of those boards to acknowledge that, that new factor. Um, and, and we will see divestment coming within a year or two. But again, after they make the decision, the fiduciary responsibility means that it'll still take them years to actually execute that uh, removal, you know, move from fossil fuels to other kinds of investments. Um, I, I would encourage anybody, and of course, I'm anxious now as, as someone who's still committed to divestment to recognize that now an additional target for us has to be those private equity funds that are, in a sense, behind, backstage that we're not seeing but are still part of our public pensions. And so that long after we successfully implement um, the members' desire to get out of fossil fuels, we'll still be stuck with them because we won't be able to see what's happening um, behind the scenes, so to speak. Um, but again, I would encourage all of us that we, what we understand works is public pressure and the coalition that the environmental groups and unions brought together. And again, the resolutions by trying to influence directly public pension funds is obviously only one of the tools in the toolbox and we need to use all of the tools uh, to be successful. But persistence does pay off. And continuously, we're building and expanding the number of activists that are engaged in this work. And of course, union members are also members of other statewide organizations like 350.org and Food and Water Watch. So there's, there's a way in which the overlapping memberships increases our power. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Next is Paul Finch. Paul is the treasurer and chief financial officer of the British Columbia Government and Service Employees Union. He's responsible for B BCGEU's ethical investment program and policy on housing affordability and land economics. In 2014, Paul led the effort to divest the union strike fund and the union's general reserves from fossil fuels. During his career in the civil service, Paul worked primarily in real estate and information technology project management. Paul received his ICDD designation through the Director's Education Program and Institute of Corporate Directors. Paul actively chairs the pension board and is a trustee on another and acts as the appointing plan sponsor for three pension plans. Welcome, Paul. Uh, thanks a lot, Michael. And I just want to give a shout out to everyone, uh, all the other speakers and a great Great line of speakers on this uh, this panel, so real privilege to be here, and, and special thanks to the organizers. Uh, I'm coming to you from Port Moody uh, here in British Columbia, which is the unceded traditional territory of the uh, Tsleil-Waututh and Coquitlam, uh, and where I live is actually uh, a former Tsleil-Waututh village uh, called Sasamit. Um, anyway, I'm yeah, very very privileged to be here, and I, I just wanted to kind of very informally uh, use this opportunity to. Just talk about our experience and how this has informed us. So, uh, really, what our relationship is to this and and to these pension funds and and uh, our, our direct investments and how our direct investment experience has informed how we view the broader markets. So, I first want to start by saying that um, I'm not here speaking on behalf of any of the uh, pension boards I sit on or the Investment Management Corporation for the Province of British Columbia, which I also sit on the board of. Uh, and so, I'm I'm here speaking on behalf of my union. Um, the, you know, as a union, we, we have a number of members and we've, we've worked very hard to expand, uh, the retirement security for our membership. Um, but that also means that we appoint and train a lot of trustees to these boards. And so we're trying to do better when it comes to being able to train those trustees to understand how, how, especially as lay trustees, how to really understand how this investment world works, how to pro appropriately and accurately measure risk. Uh, and how to make decisions that are that are in the best 
uh, long-term financial interests uh, you know, of, of beneficiaries. Uh, when it comes to our unions funds, um, in 2014, I, I was elected treasurer of the union. So I'm an elected CFO, basically, of the union. So I was elected treasurer in 2014. And um, one of the things I did was bring to our executive committee, uh, I did a basically a aggressive analysis of kind of the fossil fuel industry in Canada. And what I found was is that uh, the energy subsector in the TSX, the Toronto Stock Exchange, had, had been losing against the rest of the exchange every year since 2005. And, uh, and so this, this, is, this is in 2014. And this made a lot of sense because it, it kind of contrasts with Canada's approach to energy from the United States. And so I actually went to my executive at the time and, and based on that analysis, uh, I said, look, um, you know, it, it's fairly certain that we can, that we're actually going to be better off if we divest. And, and another point we brought forward, I brought forward was, is that uh, a prediction that the fossil, the oil market would crash to $45 a barrel in January of 2015. And so uh, initially our, our executive, which are the trustees of our union's assets, and the, these aren't a lot of assets by pension funds, but, but they are by measure of a union. So we currently we've got over 140 million, right, in assets right now in, in these. So, so this is a substantial fund for a union, not for a pension fund. Uh, but our experience taught us a lot of lessons. And so and initially our trustees, uh, and this is probably due to me not making the case properly, but our trustees actually voted down divestment. And it was only when um, I did a bit more education and then also when oil prices started to go down uh, as predicted that uh, I brought back the motion a few months later to our executive committee and they reversed their decision. Uh, so we were able to, the, the next challenge was we, you know, we were already in a fully divested global equities fund. The next challenge was to divest our Canadian equities and, and our, our manager actually refused to create a, a, a segregated FFX fund that was actively managed. And so we thought we would have to just go into an index fund, but we wanted the value of active management on top of that restricted uh, group of fossil fuel free funds. And so when I say fossil fuel free, it's free of utilities, free of pipelines and um, free of energy stocks. And uh, when we did that, uh, we, we actually moved our money out of our Canadian equities provider. And they kind of said to us, okay, well, if you put your money back in, we'll, we'll create this segregated fund for you. Um, and so we did that. And uh, it's, it's been really good. And we've, what, what we learned is, is that in the course of doing that, in the course of divesting from fossil fuels, we significantly de-risked our portfolio. And of course, when the oil crash fully happened, uh, we came off very well to our membership because we said, look, we, not only did we predict this, but we made, we made you millions off of this. And, uh, and we did the right ethical thing. And I think that, that it, it, it comes down to risk management, right? What, what I'm finding across the board is that the risks associated with these investments are not being properly analyzed or understood. And, and that's fundamental to this whole thing because what we find is that in our portfolio, our downside risk is only 60% of that of a regular downside risk in a portfolio. And that's almost purely due to us basically cutting out what are these very, very risky categories. You know, and so when we when we analyze kind of the information ratios, so that's a measurement of standard deviation on the benchmarks uh, of these investment categories. We found that they were they were all not only riskier but had lower returns. So it just made absolutely no sense. So I just want to emphasize how well this divestment program in the public equities market has worked out for us. Um, since divestment, we've net of fees. Our unions has, has earned 12.5% approximately in the market on average every year, right? On top of that, the Canadian equity firm, investment firm that initially refused to create the segregated fund, uh, the other year they created a clone fund because it was their best performing fund so they could move other clients into a pooled version of the fund that we created with them. So to give you an example, it, it's wildly successful. And we're actually able to measure quite well what the, uh, you, you know, where the where the superior performance comes from. Some of it's from active management. We've also divested our bonds and our, and our global equities, obviously from from fossil fuels. But you know what we found across the board is that fundamentally we're just doing much better as a result. And and what we found is is that people if people don't have the tools to properly measure uh, what's happening or measure the markets, then they're not able to make informed decisions in the best interest of their members or their beneficiaries. So 
what, how does this relate to the private equity markets? Well, we've, you know, what we've tried to do is really focus on being able to properly train our trustees with some of these principles that are not out there. So uh, what, there's two main angles, I think, that need to be understood here. Because first, I want to say everything we did, we did purely on the basis of a fiduciary responsibility to seek the best uh, return at the least risk for our members. And we carry that same, that same philosophy into all of the pension work we do as well. And that's why we divested. And so, uh, you know, what we found as, as a union is that in a segregated fund, it also allowed us the ability to um, engage, create our own shareholder campaigns. And I know many unions in the United States or international unions, uh, such as Unite here in SEIU have excellent shareholder engagement campaigns. This is new, new field for us, but you know, what we've been able to do is file shareholder resolutions that we believe will improve the performance of these companies uh, by having them engage in more ethical investments. And so all of this is to say that this is kind of the tack we've taken around educating our trustees internally as a union about what we've done internally. And this has informed our practice. So when it comes to things like private equity markets, we need to understand, we need to take the lessons that we've learned from divestment in the public equity field and we need to understand that we need better reporting. Uh, you know, the, it's, a, it's a cliched statement, but what doesn't get measured doesn't get managed. And we need to better understand what the risk is. And we need better measurements of risk. And we need less blind trust of <clears throat> agents of boards and agents uh, of investment agents saying, oh, well, no, no, this is the only way to measure it, or this is how it is. We, we need critical thinkers and analysts. And we need to appoint more critical thinkers to these boards to under who are equipped and educated with the tools to be able to understand the risks that exist. Because if, if you're, so there's two main angles to go at this from, which is what I was getting at. One is purely from a fiduciary perspective around what are our obligations, um, you know, or, or you know, to, to, to measure this risk. And the Canadian Climate Law Initiative, which is partially based out of the University of British Columbia here has done some excellent work on that. The other side of this is the specific technical measurement of what is the risk? What is the volatility in these asset classes? And the fairly opaque nature of private equity means that we need to take the lessons learned from public equity divestment and apply this in the private equity field uh, to success. And I think that really starts fundamentally for us as a labor union representing over 80,000 members with educating our members and our trustees about how that works. So uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Paul. And uh, finally, but not least, is Mitch Vogel. Mitch Vogel has served as a trustee of the $21 billion Illinois State University Retirement System for 20 years. He's also served as board president for five years. He is currently a board member of the Council of Institutional Investors. His roots in the labor movement are deep as he has served as president of the University Professionals of Illinois AFT 4100, vice president of Illinois Federation of Teachers AFT, and is a member of the AFT Pensions Trustee Council. He is a professor emeritus of educational leadership of Northeastern Illinois University. Welcome, Mitch. Thank you. Um, again, like all the other speakers have stated, it is uh, really uh, not just an honor, but it's been very educational for me. I've learned a lot from the previous speakers and I appreciate that. Uh, before I start, I'd like to make two detours. Uh, one is uh, the same that I think Paul just did. I have to state up front that I'm not speaking for my pension board. Um, we have orders from our attorney general of the state that when we speak, we've got to identify ourselves as speaking for ourselves. However, I want to add to that and state that I've uh, uh, devoted a good part of my life to making sure that my ideas become the ideas of the board that I'm working on. So even though uh, right now I can't say that I'm speaking for uh, the Illinois State University Retirement System, I can state that I'm doing everything possible to make sure that I will be speaking. Views that you're hearing right now are the views that um, they'll be hearing. Uh, the second detour, uh, which is perhaps the, the most important to me, and it's what I I'm interested in because of what I heard here today. Um, it's ironic to me that many union employees uh, spend many hours working while they're working to strengthen and maintain their salary and standard of living, uh, but they don't pay as much attention to the fate of their pension system. Uh, the average 
employee in my system works 26 years before they collect a pension, they're going to be collecting a pension for over 27 years. So they're putting all their efforts and energy into the first 26 years of their career. Uh, but I continue as a professor and, and activist to say that my career doesn't end when I walk across the place and get a, a professor emeritus tag. Uh, we're, we're still here. And I'm surprised, but I'm, I'm surprised that there hasn't been more attention by retirees. I can't state that the average pension board election, where and many of the trustees are elected, uh, have less than 10% turnout in the election. I can't state that uh, when we have lobby days, even on pension issues, we have very, very few retirees come. I can't state that uh, uh, when we have legislative hearings uh, or attendance of at the legislative hearings, we have very few retirees come. So one of the things I got here today was the realization that we have this tremendous power in our hands to make change. And we have a lot of issues to deal with, but it would be wonderful if we could get more, more attendance by retirees um, in, in these things, because we had the power. We also have the money, I might add. Um, the uh, My pension fund uh, is one of the mid-sized pension funds in the country, we have $22 billion on our hands to invest and make changes. And are we using that $22 billion to make change or are we doing it to get the best possible return regardless of the consequences of, uh, of our investments? Uh, I'm a member of the Council for Institutional Investors. Uh, I'm a member of the Board of Directors and organization of both public and private pension funds uh, representing 41 billion, excuse me, 41 trillion dollars in assets. Not that's with a T, trillion dollars in assets. The state of Washington's operating budget is 59 billion. So just think of the power that the pension funds have. And if we could just unleash uh, and, get, and enable more and more retirees to take part in what we do, I think we'll be making a lot more change than we maybe could even do as, as union members. Uh, so that's my detour. Thanks to the previous speakers because they formulated, helped me formulate those thoughts. I mean, it's really important. But now let me talk about some of the things I do want to talk about in terms of Illinois serves. We are one of four major pension funds in the state of Illinois. And like other states, we're not consolidated. There's one for state employees, there's one for downstate non-Chicago teachers, and there's one for Chicago teachers. Um, we all basically get along, but we all have separate interests and we have separate motives. Some are more interested in divesting than others, um, and they move forward. We, my board is an 11 member board uh, appointed, uh, excuse me, 11 member board. The chair is appointed by the governor and he basically is a spokesperson for the governor. Uh, and he's a spokesman for us when he talks to the governor uh, and four other people are appointed by the governor, but there are six elected by participants in annuitants. So when push comes to shove, and if everybody's there, we're able to get some positive things done by the pensioners. And we've gotten a lot done, um, not as much as all of us would like, but in terms of the present discussion on private equity, uh, our board is split. There are some board members who feel that uh, we can't turn away from the alpha. Uh, the profits that the private equity uh, return is, is not worth walking away from. Others say it's bad morally. We shouldn't invest in something where there's no transparency or no guarantees. And then the third says, well, the, the third part of the board says that there's good equity and there's bad equity. The good private equity is bad private equity. We have to pick and choose. And a couple of examples of that. One, in terms of private equity, we just bought a 75 million dollar uh, package uh, for uh, windmills uh, called the Global, Global Renewable Energy Fund. And we got that through BlackRock, who's sitting here. So they, uh, thank you. It seems like a good program. Uh, we probably criticize you for a lot of things, but that looks like a good one. That's good private equity. There's also pr bad private equity. And we, we move on that. Uh, we, we bought into a uh, a private equity firm which bought out an old Goodyear plant in Southern Illinois, close to St. Louis, uh, promised us great returns, uh, but we found out that they got those returns by laying off all the union employees in the factory and hiring a bunch of scab labor. Uh, they also were able to uh, get permission from a local mayor who subsequently resigned uh, 
in their small town to dump a lot of toxic waste into the rivers. Uh, so we went to um, our private equity manager and we pulled out of that. It cost us a lot of money uh, because we, you can't leave these funds, which are you, you sign on for five to 15 years uh, without a penalty. And we paid the penalty because it was worth it. And that formulated uh, a, a lot of thinking on our part where we decided not to invest it directly in, uh, in non-renewable energy and in things that were uh, uh, detrimental to the whole society. Because if we make a little bit of money on a private equity fund, which is messing up the environment, we're gonna lose more money from the state because they're spending millions, if not billions of dollars to clean up that river. River, we, we gain some money uh, each year, about five figures of, you know, not much, ten twenty thousand $20,000. It wasn't a major investment, but we gained that, but we lost when the state came to us and said, we don't have as much money to give to pension funds this year because we're doing this, 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 this. And one of those things is cleaning up the Illinois River. We're not ahead of the game. So it was a financial decision that even moved some of the more conservative members of the board. But the most important thing we did, and it dealt with uh, all matters of private equity, is we thought we have allies in the state legislature. Illinois, like Washington, I suspect, is a uh, is an all blue state. We have a progressive coalition of state legislators and all state officials. Uh, so we created some legislation which passed and is now the law of the land uh, called the Illinois Sustainable Investing Act. And that act states uh, very clearly that uh, it's uh, the purpose of this act to prudently integrate sustainability factors into the investment decision-making analysis portfolio construction uh, et cetera, et cetera, to more effectively execute fiduciary duties. And what do they mean by sustainability? Because it's something we help write. Uh, one, corporate governance and leadership factors. And one of the things about corporate governance is, is some level of transparency. So we have been told by the state legislature, so even if we have more conservative members coming on, we have to state that we can't invest in this company because they're not transparent or they're um, doing things in, in an inappropriate way. Environmental factors that may be adverse uh, to uh, wastewater management, waste and hazardous materials management and ecological impacts and greenhouse gas emissions. So we cannot invest in things that do not protect the environment. Three, social capital factors that impact relations with uh, key outside parties, such as customers, the public, et cetera human capital factors, which includes union labor rights. So we cannot invest in companies that are not effectively helping or working specifically to hurt labor movements. Um, and we, uh, we, we're very proud of that. It took a lot of work, but we did get a pass. And so now it's not up to us as we did in the situation with that rubber factory to indicate why uh, we're pulling out. We're being told by the state that we have to pull out and it puts, makes the, the impetus a lot different. And um, so I think that's, that's been very important. And I, I, I'm looking forward to uh, re-looking at our portfolio. We, we started with uh, racial and gender diversity on boards. We won't give money to any company that doesn't have a diverse uh, board of directors or diverse uh, leadership staff and uh, diverse meaning both gender and, and racial. Um, and that's the first act we took in response to this. And it was able, we were able to move not just the, the labor members on the board, which there are a few, uh, but the more conservative and, uh, and others. Uh, so that's what I'm looking forward to the future. I, I'm looking forward to um, implementing the Sustainability Act. Uh, and I'm also looking forward to seeing the progress that is being made by the other panelists on, on this panel. Um, and, in this presentation, I was I learned a lot, and I appreciate uh, all your good words. And we're here to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Well, we have about a half an hour left, which is about what we were um, expecting and hoping for. And thank you all for uh, staying in within your uh, requested time limit. That means we have time for some more discussion and answering questions. Um, we sent some questions to you, and I think that 
partly in response to some questions we received from the audience and just listening to the various talks. Uh, the question that I would like to ask you has to do with the, how to generate more accountability and oversight. Um, research shows that uh, pension fund trustees acknowledge that they have little control over their investments because they are limited partners. They do cannot do much to encourage more responsible investment. When pension fund funds um, dedicate money towards a particular private equity fund, they don't know exactly where the money is, uh, what the fund is going to invest in. It could be fossil fuels, or it could be a grocery store, it could be a wind farm. It's relevant in this regard to private equity firms do not have to comply with the same public disclosure requirements as their publicly traded counterparts. Given this limitation, what can pension and fund trustees do to ensure that they have greater accountability and oversight over their investments, particularly as it relates to climate impacts? And this question generally, we have a couple of questions from audiences, how, how to get information about where the particular equity fund is investing and whether that includes fossil fuels or not. So I'll just open up to anybody on the panel who wants to respond, any and all. Well, uh, I question um, the generic answer that uh, people are giving that uh, pension trustees don't have any input into how their funds are being invested. Uh, as, uh, as I indicated, and as a previous speaker indicated, uh, we select investment managers uh, that we put into a very rigorous training and they have to respond to us with everything that they do. If they don't, we should get new investment managers. And I think that's the problem. I know uh, of a number of pension funds where they hire an investment manager and then walk away. Uh, you can't do that. You've got to go to your investment managers with, uh, with all sorts of uh, uh, important questions and data, et cetera. We have a very lengthy uh, 14, 15 page questionnaire that we give everybody who's applying, you know, for to, to be an investment manager. Um, and we don't walk away. I mean, they, they report to us every month uh, or, uh, or more. And we have watch lists and other things. If we don't like the answers, we put them on a watch list. And uh, we, we've been known to get rid of pension uh, investment managers before the time is up. And we will continue to do that. You got to be vigilant. And I think for someone to say that, they're just taking the easy way out. Or in some states, the state doesn't give them I, the, the recent stuff about Pennsylvania, which I don't know all the detail. They're saying they don't have any input into how the funds are spent. But I, um, if that's the case, that's, a, that's legitimate. But I, I think in many cases, I, in one of the pension funds in Illinois, they say that, I know it's not true. They just, they say that we're not experts. We don't know how to deal with this. Well, then we should be experts. Let's do it as important as investments are, it's not rocket science. Uh, I have a comment if I can. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, think, um, I think boards have four main tools they can use in this regard. And, and so, you know, one tool is the selection of your investment manager. And, uh, you know, Mitch, Mitch has kind of touched on that. Um, another is the, you know, basically when, the, when a board sets the, uh, the SIP or the Statement of Investment Policies and Procedures, uh, that kind of outlines, uh, you know, asset ratios, all that kind of stuff. Uh, another tool, and, and, and those are the two obvious tools I think every board uses. The, the two ones that boards I think don't use enough is one is, uh, is in particular, uh, ongoing management of, of metrics and performance reporting that exceeds uh, what is typically offered. And uh, that's, you know, boards shouldn't simply accept the, the metrics that are being presented to them. They should come up with their own benchmarks. They should ask for their own metrics and reports, and they should make sure that they're measuring risk in other ways. And you know that the, the other side of it is, is, is boards should have responsible investment committees because there's a serious ongoing reputational risk um, you know, associated with a lot of this that, that is overlooked. Uh, you know, in, in particular, if you, um, you know, Slato had some excellent comments about some risks that exist, you know, in, 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 in an investment there uh, that you wouldn't necessarily see if you were just looking at a performance against a benchmark as part of a broader asset category, right? So, so those, these, are, these are tools that boards need to pick up on and need to start utilizing. And one of the tools that a board can especially use is a negative screen. And, and I don't see this a lot, but... Um, it, oftentimes it makes a lot more sense to simply implement a negative screen for an asset or an asset subclass than it may then to simply switch out managers, right? Um, sometimes you, you basically want to say 
screen X, Y, Z out. And I think that's an important tool. Again, we have a lot of educational work to do with boards because oftentimes trustees may lack the confidence to make the decisions in the best interest of their beneficiaries. Alyssa. Um, I really appreciate the responses from the trustees sitting on this panel. Trustees have a tough job. I, I would like to uh, go back to something, Paul, that you said earlier, that if you can't measure it, you don't really know the risk. And part of the challenge with fossil fuels across um, the entire portfolio, private and public asset classes, is the externalities, right? Like the fossil fuel industry has pushed off responsibility for their impacts on the world and those costs have been shifted off of their own books, but society is paying the price. And so I, I do think, and Mitch, you gave an example of that as well, right? Where an investment may have been profitable, but it cost the state in cleanup. And so the net is a loss for everyone, um, for the environment, for the community and for the state. So I, I think it is absolutely critical that trustees, that institutional investors and uh, regulators as well, press for more transparency about what the impacts are, what the risks are, because I don't think anyone knows. No one has enough information among institutional investors to make informed decisions because so much of that information is not being measured. Uh, so I, I do think this is a moment to call for that. And, and I will note that while the private equity industry doesn't have regulatory obligations to disclose at this moment, um, we hope that the SEC will uh, see the need to, to uh, require more disclosure, both from publicly traded and private managers. Um, but even without that, the industry voluntarily has adopted ESG policies. They write ESG reports, the private equity industry, it's very subjective. But the reason that that exists is because institutional investors have requested it over the years and, and subject them to questionnaires, such as what Mitch described when they're in the due diligence process of committing to a fund. So that creates an enormous opportunity for institutional, institutional investors to request or require in order to make a commitment that managers lay out their transition plan. By 2030, you need to be out of fossil fuels. Here's all of the science that tells us that our economy and our society are at risk. If we don't make this shift now, tell us your plan. What are the incremental benchmarks, right? We need to see what your impacts are. What are your direct and indirect emissions from pipelines, from drilling operations, from offshore uh, Gulf drilling, from uh, um, you know, export terminals? You don't have the enough information to make informed decisions at this moment. And so in order to protect your funds, your fiduciary duty, it's time to demand more of those private funds uh, so that you can make informed decisions and they provide the transparency about how they're both accounting for their contributions to climate change and transitioning in a way that is responsible toward the communities like Slado's and the Wet'suwet'en and other impacted communities, as well as the overall climate impacts. Anyone else? One um, related issue is, is the practice of what's often called greenwashing, which is that lots of private equity firms claim that uh, they are committed to ESG and it's important to their operations, but many continue to invest billions in long-term fossil fuel infrastructure. And that raises an issue, what information is, can be trusted? What is the form that the inf information is often provided uh, on request? Is it confidential? Is it, pub is it open and public? Um, how, do we, how do we deal with this sort of practice of, of greenwashing, which, is, which is, can be very effective in terms of protecting uh, investment firms? I mean, in the sense, duplicity is profitable, right? I, I can uh, I can take a stab at this, but I want to see if any any of my co-panelists have anything first. Okay, so I, I mean, 
what this comes down to is I, I think you're right seeing a plan and in my in my mind the plan there's so a typical greenwashing tactic tactic is simply to project in the future what a natural trend for a declining investment in fossil fuel in infrastructure will be and then to announce that as as simply being like what what you're going to do to address climate change because there is in the market right now naturally in port investment portfolios a decline in net new investment in fossil fuel infrastructure often and the reason is because or at least in the public equities market and the reason is is because it's a it, overall so it'll drag performance if it's too high a part of your uh your your portfolio it'll it'll be a net negative drag on performance and so th the problem is is that if someone makes a promise far enough out in the future that's not a promise that's propaganda right like that it, it's not it's not an actual if it's not tied into your your SIP and your investment strategy, but it's simply an announcement by an investment manager or something, that's not actually something that's a strategy, right? It's an announcement, right? It's a press release. And I think we need to d distinguish between a, a front-facing press release that's done for that purpose versus a board making an educated decision to set certain, you know, investment targets or restrictions based on that. And so like, the, the fundamental problem here is, is that you have is uh, not a lot of people follow this stuff. Okay. <laughs> like, 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 and there's very few outlets for this. And so it's incumbent on institutions like unions that have some organized capability and power and scope and universities, et cetera, to basically put on the best possible education so that the people who are in positions of power to affect these decisions actually have the tools to be able to make these decisions. And one of the most powerful tools from the public standpoint when it comes to something like greenwashing is it, when somebody does that, it opens them up to the tremendous potential of public scrutiny if someone chooses to leverage public opinion in a very targeted, succinct way. And we've seen that happen, right? So, uh, and then that in turn becomes a reputational risk that feeds back to trustees in that cycle. Yeah, let me... And I think another form of greenwashing happens not now for CUNY, a lot of our members are actually in TIA as a defined contribution plan. And we and, and CUNY management has some influence over those funds. They attempt to respond to what is now the environmental concerns because now they're, you know, their investors, you know, their individual investors are asking them why are, you know, I want a fossil free equity fund and you have hundreds to choose from, why don't you have an equity? And their response is, we have a low carbon fund. And, and I think in some ways when they switch from oil to gas, they would, that's a certain level of greenwashing. So there is tremendous resistance. Um, and I think it just requires more, you know, more member resolve to move their money when, when that doesn't, when they don't meet the terms that you want to meet and to use the union as well as CUNY managements to press groups like TIA because they also hold billions and trillions of pension funds. I don't think the answer is any different uh, than what it was for those of us in the union movement uh, had to set up a union. You just, you just gotta be active and vigilant and go through the items that Paul and others have mentioned um, in order to stay on top of things. I mean, we just, uh, we have this vast army of retirees and, and so I know some of them might be infirmed, but one of the things we learned from the, the pandemic is that we could do Zooms all the time and people who don't want to go to the state capitol to demonstrate can get on a, a Zoom conference. And we just got to be militant and, and agitate and educate and uh, we'll solve the problem. This, nothing new, uh, nothing new, nothing. We don't have to do anything different. Just do what we've always done. And, um, we, and, we'll, and, it's, and we're doing it. You know, the fact that people are bothering doing greenwashing means that, you know, that we've, we've pricked something in their, in their, in their uh, corporate conscience or corporate uh, tactic. Um, so I, you know, I think we're, we're being, the mere fact that they, they set up and they're engaging in greenwashing means that we've been effective. We just got to finish the job. That's all. 
Yeah, I'll add to, uh, I think that I agree with what everybody's saying in terms of um, greenwashing. The same is happening with indigenous justice um, policies and procedures within companies. Um, and the fact that people have to do their work. You know, we, the Witsuotin sat down with um, JBIC, uh, an international bank investment company from Japan and had a face to, or had a face-to-face -face Zoom meeting with them about what is actually going on because a lot of the indigenous policies, just like the environmental policies within companies um, require a certain level of um, you know, consent or a certain level of information. And a lot of that is being construed as band council signing on when it's the true sovereign leaders of the nations um, aren't providing consent. And so having those sit down face-to-face -face meetings is really important. And that's what we've been striving to do with investors that don't actually, they're not getting the information. We know they're not getting the information. And so we're making an effort to reach out to those investors and give them the information that they're not getting just to let them know that they're not getting the proper information. And so I think that there should be a huge responsibility um, and even legislation around Around having that um, having that information be provided and having direct contact with the people that are actually impacted on the ground. Well, can I ask? Can you say more about what message you want to send to um, KKR and other public fund uh, public uh, fund investors? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting, um, a really interesting relationship. And this happens, you know, things are so different in the United States and other countries um, than they are in Canada in a lot of ways. And so Indigenous laws, Indigenous resistance, Indigenous sovereignty um, is really forcing and pushing the envelope in so-called Canada. And that is something that will not be able to be ignored for a long time. Um, it has been, but we are pushing the boundaries at unprecedented rates. Um, there's international legislation. There's all of these different issues that are coming up and it's not going to be an option soon to have an indigenous policy. Investors um, aren't just, you know, as the, one of the other panelists had mentioned, the fact that people are greenwashing things speaks to the fact that things are changing and they're changing very dramatically and very quickly. And the same goes for indigenous policies um, and the impacts on indigenous communities and indigenous rights. And the fact that in the province of British Columbia, um, there are no treaties, you know, there, there are, there are a couple, but most of the lands um, in so-called British Columbia are unceded, are sovereign territories. There have never been treaties signed. There aren't agreements with the province, with the federal government. And that's an issue. That's an issue that um, American companies should know about. That's the issue that international companies should know about when they're planning to invest um, on in, in projects that go through unceded Indigenous territories because those projects will be met with resistance and resistance is growing um, really rapidly in so-called British Columbia and Canada. And it's not something that the governments can turn a blind eye to anymore. And so just, you know, as, as was discussed earlier, there are costs to that. You know, you think that you're, you're gonna be saving money and you're gonna be making money in this investment in Coastal Gas Link. And then the state is paying millions and millions and millions of dollars um, to deal with the resistance that's happening on the ground. You know, in the 2019 blockade, 2018-19 blockade in Wet'suwet'en territory, um, the first month, you know, the first few months of, of action um, cost millions of dollars. The one day raid on Wet'suwet'en territory cost the state $3 million dollars to have all of their um, militarized RCMP, to have the attack dogs, to have the helicopters. This is costing a lot of money and it's not, uh, people need to know the actual details of what's happening on the ground. Um, that uh, raises, I think another question or points towards another question and that is about role for increased government regulation. Uh, it's been mentioned in, by several of you about uh, Securities and Exchange Commission um, looking into increasing public disclosure requirements, looking into ESG related misconduct. Um, what other form, is, are there other uh, types of government action do you think are necessary or could be undertaken that would deal with these issues? Um, 
I have a quick comment on this. You know, most of the issues that get raised with ethical investing or responsible investing are a result of a lack of proper government regulation. And the frustration point for trustees becomes um, they're being asked to have their pension investments uh, withdraw from profitable investments that others can invest in or to not play by the same rules that everyone else can play by to make money off of those investments. And that's a very difficult thing for trustees uh, that have a fiduciary responsibility to make the highest possible returns at the least risk to do, right? Now, you can do that. I'm not saying you can't, but you need to be very careful and deliberate about how you do that in a way that is about preserving the long, the in the investment horizon you have, the, the best interest of your beneficiaries. And the problem is, is that it's up to government regulation to determine that playing field, right? So often what's happening is, is the government's refusal to regulate, whether it's the housing. So I'll give you a classic example. People blame rates, you know, real estate investment trusts for housing prices here. And, and in the States to a certain extent, when it's just, it's purely due to government regulation or, Similarly, in, in the fossil fuels sector, um, the amount of, uh, you know, wells and exploratory stuff that has not been properly cleaned up uh, in some of these territories, um, and including in, in Treaty 8 territory here in BC, right? Like you just have tons of situations where it's really hurt these herds going through. It's like caused massive damage to land. And, and there's no cleanup because the government, either the government regulation doesn't exist or it's improperly or negligently enforced. And that's a huge problem, right? That's a huge, huge problem uh, that needs to be addressed. Alyssa. I mean, I, I think, I hope that one of the takeaways from this conversation today is that we need both, right? We need institutional investors and trustees to be actively demanding more information and a commitment to transition responsibly away from fossil fuels on the 10 year timeline that science says we need. We also need regulation to support those efforts. Neither one can take care of it entirely on its own. Um, and they operate on slightly different timelines. So even if we were to be successful in the US and get the SEC to demand uh, disclosures, it's probably a couple of years down the road before it gets fully implemented. Um, so we need to press for that, but we also need to press for voluntary disclosures now. And institutional investors are the ones that have the leverage to do that should they choose to use it. Um, and you know, we, we talked a lot about KKR today. They are one of many. Each individual private equity manager needs to make that commitment on their own. Um, and not leave it to sort of generic industry-wide uh, greenwashing because that has been to date what we've experienced. Um, you know, some number of firms have committed, are signed on to the UN principles of responsible investment. Uh, they've committed to using SASB uh, accounting to measure inside their portfolios, but they're not making any of that information public. So while they claim that it's part of their investment process, nobody really knows what the results are. Uh, no one's disclosing what their emissions are from their portfolios. And so what you have is rhetoric that aligns with some of the sort of widely accepted principles, but no actual disclosure. And we need both regulatory and uh, voluntary action on as soon as possible. And I, I believe that in this space, we're, in, we're at a moment where institutional investors and public pension funds can move the ball forward and regulators are gonna have to catch up. Uh, but we don't have time to wait for the regulation, which is like an important necessary process. I completely agree with you, Paul, but it's slow moving. Um, and so we all of you that are trustees and manage assets for, foundations for pension, private and public pension funds, now is the time to act because the window is closing. Have, have all of you seen the uh, AFTs, uh, AFT circulating, it's not their report, but they're circulating their the report on, uh, pub, on private equity. Um, uh, you haven't seen, it's just, it just came out. I'll, I'll see to it that uh, 
Viddy gets it and she can distribute it because it answers many of the, the questions and it certainly answers the call that Alyssa just made. Uh, uh, so I think that's that's important. I, I might add a, a note of skepticism, uh, uh, which I can do because I'm the oldest person here, um, that if we start making private equity more transparent and more visible, they're not going to exist because the reason why they do exist is that they don't, they don't want to be transparent. They don't want to abide by the rules of the SEC. You know, if, if they wanted to abide by the rules of the SEC, they do the same thing they're doing now, but they do it in the public sector. So, but that's my skepticism. Uh, we have to keep the pressure on. But I don't think the answer is transparency. The answer is, is greed and, and we've got to deal with that. So that's my, my closing thoughts as, a, as an old man here, okay. Other thoughts, comments? I was wondering, we, we circulated um, a summary of a recent uh, study by PricewaterhouseCoopers about um, European firms that seemed to indicate that there is a significantly increasing commitment to um, putting ESG at the heart of their business strategy. Um, any sense about why Europe has moved further and faster or whether that has any implications for the US and Canada? Stronger labor movement. Yeah, I would agree that it is the stronger labor movement. And, and also, in other words, I think reminding that pensions uh, investments are supposed to be for the long term. And I think we have to think carefully about, you know, whether it's private equity or other uh, sort of hedge funds that promise big returns but charge used fees. Because one of the studies in New York, there was a question as to whether they should hire managers at all, that if they just invested across, across the public funds equally and just hired a city manager at much less, at a substantial salary, but still much less than the kind of uh, fees that they get from these professional managers, the pension fund would end up with more money in it. So, so, so again, we have to be careful. And in some places, I think management, especially if on the, from the employer side, if if they're in a pinch financially, they're willing to risk more thing, you know, a higher risk fund for short returns because they want to avoid having to add to themselves, whether it's the city or the state, et cetera, to the pension fund. But that's what has put pension funds in trouble is the local and state and citywide governments refusing to put in the appropriate amount of money. In New York, that's regulated by law. But in many states that have troubled public pensions, it's because they were able to escape that and sometimes just skate when there were high returns and not have to worry about it and then cry when there's the cyclical you know, recession and all of a sudden they have to put money in. And then they sort of see uh, the pensioners as too well off. <laughs> and that's their response. So. Oops, we lost. I, I would, I would say I, I would agree with um, the, the comments about the need for a stronger labor movement. I would also say a, a more democratic, internally democratic labor movement. And there's a direct correlation with the internal de democratization of the labor movement and better outcomes. And uh, we've seen that here. Um, but what I will say, we, we've got a long way to go here in Canada. What I will say is, our under the Maple model of joint trusteeship. Our pension, our public pension funds, for example, here in Canada, are all in a surplus, a very healthy surplus position, are all well funded. Okay, we are about out of time. I want to thank all of our panelists for these very enlightening and surprisingly encouraging discussions of these very important issues. Uh, I want to turn it over to Rithi, I think, who has a final couple of comments. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, yes, so on behalf of the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies, I'd like to thank Michael for doing such an excellent job moderating, Andrew Hedden for various Zoom technical skills behind the scenes, and our esteemed panel. Uh, we know that you're all very busy and very much appreciate you making the time to share your perspectives on a very important issue impacting us all. Thank you so much. 
And last but not least, we'd like to thank all of our wonderful attendees. Thank you for participating. And we hope that this was a valuable discussion. We'll be sending out a very short survey to each of you and would appreciate any of feedback you can provide on this forum. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day.